Good afternoon. My name is John Chapman. I'm the Small Business Commissioner and welcome to our webinar, How Safe Is Your Small Business From Cybercrime? We acknowledge that the land that we broadcast from today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and we also pay our respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people who may be watching today. Our speaker tonight was Sergeant Jonathan Newman and we'll come to Sergeant Newman very shortly to take you through a very interesting world of what's happening in the, uh, out there in the ether. But I'll just run through a few things in terms of our office. Uh, for those who haven't joined us before, our office specialises in alternative dispute resolution, solving disputes between businesses, business and local government, and indeed business and state government. Various acts, I won't go into the details. The one that we're doing a lot of work on at the moment uh, is in the area of retail and commercial leasing, and I'll talk to you about that. But the disputes you can see on the screen cover a wide range of matters. We're here to help you if you're a small business owner uh, to help you get through um, the things that are concerning you in terms of uh, some issues that you might be having with other parties. We just want to be here to help you along the way. The main area that we're working on at the moment uh, is in the area of leasing, as I mentioned. Uh, we are responsible for undertaking mediations uh, under the COVID-19 Act. There's a specific part of the Act now that deals with retail and commercial leasing, tenants who can't pay their rent, and also landlords who are having trouble with tenants who aren't paying rent. Uh, it's a two-way partnership, and our role is to try and bring the parties together and sort a way forward under the guidance of the National Code, which has been agreed by all states and the federal government. Ultimately, the, we can go to court. So it's designed to have a three-stage process, negotiations between the parties in good faith. If that doesn't work, come to us and we'll try and get the parties around the table. And we're having some very good success rates at the moment. If agreement can't be reached there, then will issue a mediation certificate which will allow the matter to be dealt with in the court. Importantly for tenants at the moment, up until the 3rd of January of next year, landlords cannot evict you. They can't take a range of actions which is spelt out in the regulations. If you go to our website, you'll see a special area on the top right hand side of the screen under updates that deals with rental issues. You can go in, into that, there's a video there that will give you details of the various pieces of legislation that deal specifically with retail and commercial leasing. For small business looking for information, there are some key sources. At a state level, business.sa.gov.au, joined with revenuesa.gov.sa.gov.au. That's the state tax office, which is responsible in terms of a number of grant programs, but also in terms of land tax. The business.sa.gov.au website will give you any other details relating to small business in South Australia, as well as broader information on programs that are available. Nationally, the business.gov.au website is the key website, along with the ATO's website. We've worked very closely with the ATO because obviously they're responsible for JobKeeper and a range of other tax concessions which are available to small business. And I would very much encourage small business to go to that website, have a look at it. You might want to talk to your accountant as well about some of the, some of the different parts of, of the packages that have been put together by the federal government through the tax office to assist you as small business. And then obviously our website is at a local level and in the alternative dispute resolution space, which we talked about, uh, simply sasbc.sa.gov.au. And I always encourage small businesses, be a part of an industry or business association because they can give you a lot of information that will help you through your particular sector. Our contact details are on the screen, phone, fax, email. Um, come in and see us here on the ground floor at 99 Baller Place. Uh, we're here to help you. As I mentioned, tonight's guest speaker is Sergeant Jonathan Newman, who's part of SAPOL's 
Financial and Cybercrime Investigation Branch, uh, Cybercrime Training and Prevention Section Supervisor. So quite a long title, but a very important one and doing some very important things to help you in business and also the wider community. The branch is responsible for increasing awareness of cybercrime and providing crime prevention advice to businesses and the community. The section works collaboratively with industry and government agencies to develop crime prevention strategies based on contemporary cybercrime issues, informing you, the community, of emerging trends and aiming you with aiming to equip you with achievable preventative solutions is an important step in disrupting cyber crimes and protecting South Australians from potential victimisation. So without further ado, I'll invite Sergeant Newman to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, John. Hello to everyone out there. This is a bit of an unusual format, but these are the times that we're in 2020. If someone should like technology, that's going to be me, but I also like having issues with it. So we'll see how we go. With John's introduction, we sort of spoke about my role within South Australia Police and my responsibility to the community. One of the benefits is that we are based within the cybercrime investigation section within South Australia Police. So we have access to timely information. We can see reports live that are coming in. We can analyse trends and we're at the forefront there that we can push this messaging out and try and disrupt cybercrime and protect South Australians and small businesses, which is why we're here tonight. So the presentation tonight is about ransomware itself. Uh, there are a few different cyber threats that uh, businesses are vulnerable to. Ransomware is the topic we're speaking about tonight, but some of the prevention me uh, measures that we'll go into will protect you against ransomware, but also other types of cyber attacks. So the purpose of tonight is to try and provide some advice. Small business don't often have access to IT support or have IT personnel. And the advice that we give is low level that you can implement yourself and also either free or extremely low cost effective. Okay, we understand that times are tough. This is just some techniques to improve cybersecurity in your business. And this has been tailored specifically for this event tonight. So why is this an issue? If we have a look at the data, loss of the scam. So this is from the ACCC targeting scams 2019 report. So this is last year's data. Of concern is, there's obviously an upward trend that you can see there, but of concern is the big jump between 2018 and 2019. That is quite considerable. And this is Australia wide, but we're looking at $143 million lost to scams alone. That is Australians hard earned cash that have been lost to scams. Now, this is 2019 data. Obviously we're still going through 2020. Unfortunately, we expect this to be another big step when the report comes in this time next year. The COVID situation, the pandemic has led to more people having to work from home, uh, more people spending time online, shopping online, people are stuck at home and lonely, falling victim to romance scams, people are short of cash, so you've got employment scams, investment scams, and then you've got uh, attacks such as business email compromise and ransomware in particular, which we're going to speak about tonight. So when I talk about ransomware and malware reports, and I'll get into what ransomware is soon if you are unfamiliar with it, but this is the South Australian figure taken from that same ACCC report. So this is the number of ransomware malware reports that were reported for 2019. So 394. Now we know that reports are underreported, so we'd expect the true figure to be much higher. And although it's a three figure sum, that's more than one attack per day against a South Australian. So that is quite significant when you look at uh, the size of our population. And we'll go into the, the damage that it can do to a business, which can be quite debilitating. So how does it work, the process? First attackers need to gain access. And there are a couple of different ways that they do this, and we'll cover that off shortly. Once it's got access, ransomware will be downloaded, installed, will be infected within the computer. And what that does, basically it goes and encrypts all the files on that computer, all the data. 
So what encryption does, it just basically locks you out. It's like locking you out of your whole computer, your whole system, and not having access to that key. And then I ask for the ransom, which is where the ransom, where part of this phrase comes in. That's the request for payment to decrypt, which is basically unlock and get back access to, to all your um, information. So what does it look like? This is just an example of what it might look like. Um, there's different makes, different types of ransomware, different um, countries, uh, origins, they might have a different format, but this is the general sort of makeup. Sort of, you've got a warning box that comes up, tells you that your files have been encrypted. They'll have a, a payment time frame. quite often it's a countdown clock just to really make you feel pressured into sorting out a solution for this. And they'll have uh, quite often two time frames like they have here. One that you need to pay the ransom by, otherwise it'll double or increase. And another deadline where that uh, information is going to be lost and you're never going to be able to access it, access it again. Uh, it's been blurred out, but the blurred out bit down the bottom there near the Bitcoin is they're asking for payment in cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is notoriously hard to track, not impossible, but harder to, to track, which is why they use these forms of, of payment methods. So cost, there's a lot of different costs associated with ransomware. And I want you to think about your particular business and how this would affect you. And it will affect each and every one of you probably differently depending on the industry and the size of your business. But the costs are actually quite significant when you stop to actually think about it. So aside from the ransomware cost, the fee that they're charging, and this is quite often based on the size of your business. So a little bit of research and they'll work out the level that you would be able to pay because if they charge too much, they're not going to get that payment. So they look at something that's going to be reasonable. They think that you would be able to pay and the best bang for their buck. Unfortunately, Australians do get targeted a lot with this sort of thing because globally, we are quite well off as far as the Australian dollar. So they do get um, returns on their investment, which is basically a business for them when it comes to ransomware. So as I said, system downtime. So the problem with, with ransomware is you've lost access to all your, all your systems. Now you might think, oh, you know, I'm gonna use my computer for this, that and that, but that could be your point of sale. It could be payee, payer accounts. It could be anything you do from day to day, anything that's electronic could be locked out. Your whole website down, so you're not getting new traffic in. Your point of sale is down, so you can't process customers. The longer this goes on, the longer it's gonna cost your business. Replacement of compromised devices or repair. The last thing you want to do is clear the ransomware and then all of a sudden keep using the same computers without some sort of replacement or IT professional to go through and make sure that it's all cleared up and you're not going to get targeted again. Loss of proprietary data. If this does become ransomware that you can only get this information back, think about if you lose all those payee and payer details, all the information that you've got on there, design, website, all those sort of things that you've now lost and have to start from scratch again, or customer records. Reputational damage, hard to put a dollar figure on. Um, and one of the main reasons for under-reporting when it comes to cybercrime, people are a bit scared of the reputational damage if they, they come out and they do disclose that something's happened. Um, but there's also been a lot of businesses that have tried to cover up these sort of things come out down the track and that ends up doing more reputational damage. So you just need to have a think about your situation and how that's going to apply to your business. So we're going to have a couple of case studies. Now these are South Australian um, and I've chosen two completely different case studies. And these have occurred in probably the last 12 months, I reckon. I've chosen these ones because they've hit the media. Um, I'm still not going to mention the business names, um, but we are talking about them because they are uh, have hit the media, so there's no confidential issues there. The first one is the Adelaide News Agent Hacking Blackmail Nightmare. The reason I use this one is because it's a small news agent business. Okay, and again, you think about ransomware, this is a business that specializes in print media. So they're not in the online world, they don't have a lot of stuff that they're using computers for. But the ransomware attack was debilitating and nearly wiped them out completely. They didn't know who they had to deliver papers to that day. They didn't know who their customers were. 
didn't have access to all their orders. They've lost access to, to anything they need to run their day-to-day -day business. So that's why I use that example because it, you think about your business and what would happen if you didn't have access to basically anything that connected to the internet. The other one is a money management company. South Australian grown, although at the time it wasn't a small business, started off as a small business within South Australia and grew beyond um, what they probably could have ever dreamed of and been a really successful business within South Australia. They, they suffered a ransomware attack. Um, they were open about it, they've come out to the media about it. They advised their customers about what was going on. Um, and I can't speak, but there's 13,000 customers that were affected by this. So their whole operation was, was um, down during the attack. So phishing, bit of an unusual term if you haven't heard it before, um, but I'll, I'll explain it to you. This is one of the ways that they can access. So if we think back to a few slides before, that first step in the process is, is the criminals need to get access to your computer, your network, your device, whatever it may be. One of the main vectors in is something called phishing. So a way that cyber criminals steal confidential information such as online banking, logins, credit card details, business login credentials, passwords or passphrases by sending fraudulent messages. So these phishing messages, as the name suggests, it is related to the sport, if you want to call it a sport phishing, um, in the sense that they're not out there to, to catch everyone. They might send out 100,000 emails and just hope that they get a couple of nibbles. So if you ever go fishing, you throw the line in, you're not there to catch everything in the water, you're just hoping that something will bite. And if you're like me, you'll go home hungry. Unfortunately, these guys quite often get fed. So the phishing, and it could be an email, could be a text message, could be a phone call, could be, could be anything, but we'll talk about emails in particular. It's going to come across as quite generic, and that's because it's, as I said, phishing. They're just casting out to 100,000 people. It's not tailored specifically to an individual or a business. So the downside for them, and a, a red flag for us, is that it's generic. So it's not going to be addressed to you. It's going to be dear value customer or dear um, to whom it may concern or something. It's not going to have your name in it because it's, it's phishing. Okay? It's going to be too time intensive for them to do that for 100,000 emails. They just send out something generic. They'll use some legitimate branding and they'll quite often um, rip off reputable brands, utility companies, government agencies in particular. Um, and the danger is really in that link or attachment. So the links they're designed to take you to a dodgy site, might look like a legitimate site. You might get an email that says, um, your payment's been declined, you need to update your bank details, you need to update your credit card details, click on the link, takes you to a site that looks like a legitimate site, but really it's not, you enter in your credit card details and they've got access to it there. Same thing it could be, you've got an issue with your Microsoft account, follow here, it looks like a Microsoft landing page, you put in your business credentials, so your username and password, they've now got access to this and then subsequently access to your systems. The attachment side is usually where the malware sort of thing comes into it and the ransomware. That's when they'll have an attachment and it might say invoice or, or something similar they want you to download, it might be a complaint against you. Um, could be as simple as a Word document or PDF. Just because it's something you know, Word, PDF does not mean it's safe. Quite often they are the main carriers of this type of um, virus. So again, how does it work? We've got I would make Gilbert there, a bit of a comic there of how it works. So, you know, first one, no good. Second one, no good. Third one, you get a hit, they get paid. So there's seven common indicators to phishing. And these are the sort of tips you need to look out for when you are going through your, through your emails. So the address not related to the sender's um, alleged identity. And I'll, I'll go through an example on the next slide and we'll go through all these so you actually see what it is that I'm talking about if it doesn't make sense at this stage. Generic salutation, which we spoke about, dear customer. Concerning or concern raising threat. So the idea is they want you to rush this decision. Something bad has happened. Your account has been suspended. The payment has not gone through. If you don't rectify this, something bad is going to happen. You will be arrested. You will end up in court. Um, something, something bad. That, that's how they, they lure you in. in. That short time frame to increase that sense of urgency. So quite often they'll say within 24 hours, this bad thing is going to happen. If you don't do this now, your account will be suspended and you'll never get access to it again. 
Now, the reason they do this short time frame is so that you're rushed into a decision. Okay, they don't want you thinking about this. They don't want you to read that email the second time. They want you to panic, start the ball rolling and fall victim to it while they've got your attention. Because quite often if you do take that time to read it a second time, things will start to seem a little bit out of place and you might pick up things that you didn't read the first time. We live in a busy society. A lot of our world at the moment is online and you're gonna be getting a lot of different correspondence, emails, you're gonna be doing multitasking, many things at once. So it's really important that if you do get something like this, just to take that time to stop what you're doing, reread it and see if this is legitimate or whether it is perhaps a phishing attempt. Poor spelling and grammar. A lot of these originate from overseas. Um, so poor spelling and grammar could be a flag. Um, if you get an email from me, it doesn't mean it's phishing, it just means that I've probably done a few typos. Suspicious to unrelated link, and I'll show you an example later. Um, that's quite often we've got the link and you think it's gonna go somewhere, but it's going somewhere completely different. And a generic sign off. So no contact details, no way to actually contact this person via phone or other means other than the correspondence that you've been sent. So we'll have a look at an example now. This is a, this is a real example. Um, and this got sent to one of the SACL accounts last year. Um, and it is so bad that it's good because it gives us a lot of these indicators that we've just spoken about. Now, you think, oh, why would they send it to police? That's just stupid. One, well, you never know who's gonna open the email and we may fall for it. But the real reason is that we were just on part of a bulk email list where they've sent this out. So again, phishing is not targeted. So we were just one of the people that received this of the many people. Now, I, I choose this example for this format in particular because it was from, well, at least be from the ACCC. So, and it relates to business. So dear business owner. Now I've got a few of those indicators we spoke about. And we start at the top. It's that first bit where it says from and complaint department. You can put whatever you want in that when you set up an email address. So just because it says who it's from doesn't mean that's actually who it's from. The bit you really want to look at is the bit that follows it in the brackets where it's got info at the I think it's complaint department dot info. That's where this email has actually come from and that's what you need to be looking at. That's only the best key to see whether this is legitimate or not. If this was from the ACCC, it wouldn't be ending in dot info. It'd be a dot gov dot au email address. You'll also note that the email address in this particular occasion is quite generic, which means that they'll use it for the ACCC now, they'll use it for something else later, because really it's just a complaint department. That could be any organisation they, they want it to be. We've got the, the branding at the top, which they've just ripped the logo off the website. It's very easy to do. Uh, they haven't read it properly though, because they've written the title as Australia Competition and Consumer Commission when it's Australian. Um, and then we've got that dear business owner. So that generic salutation that we spoke about. It's not actually addressed to anyone. The first sentence there, you can probably read, it's a bit small for my eyes back here, but basically they're saying they've got a, uh, a claim filed against you. So that's that concern that we spoke about. There's a problem, there's something they want you to address. Um, and you can just get a rebuttal period for seven business days, which is actually quite a long time period. A lot of these, as I said, is about 24 hours. Um, they've actually given you a long time, but it's a five page in totality. So, you know, they're asking for a fair, fair bit of work there. Uh, spelling mistake there, so we spoke about spelling grammar. And if you do read this email from top to bottom, you will notice a few other uh, grammatical errors. But it's that same same recipe that we spoke about before. It's generic, there's a problem, you've only got a short time frame, click here, download this. So this one's got an attachment, this could well be malicious software and it could contain ransomware. By clicking on this, if your antivirus doesn't stop it, then your whole system could be wiped out. What you can actually do is when you do get an email and try it with a legitimate email you get next time is you can actually hover your mouse over that hyperlink. So the hyperlink is that blue underlined bit. When you hover over it, it'll provide you where that link's actually gonna go. So we've got an example there on that right hand side. Now in emails, the first bit might have something to do with Outlook or protection or something, um, which is part of just the way that the URL is constructed. But if you see the URL like that, you've got to start being suspicious and really make that decision of whether this is legitimate and something you should be clicking on or avoiding. Generic sign off. Again, no one to contact, just a waiting for reply, sign off as, a, as the um, commission itself. 
So there's a fishing quiz that we won't be able to do at the moment just because of the format, um, but I'll provide the, the link to you at the end of the presentation. And it's done by the um, ACSC, which is the cyber.gov.au. So you can just uh, go to that website and type in fishing quiz. Remember fishing is PH. Um, and you can actually do this quiz and it's good. It gives you a few different examples, a few emails, a few legitimate, uh, I think there's yeah, maybe one or two legitimate, we'll actually work that out. Um, and it's got SMS in there as well. So just for yourself to identify what fishing looks like. And then also your employees. There's no point you know how to do this, but the rest of your staff don't because they could get the email and compromise the network themselves. So it is quite a good tool. Um, I'll provide a link for that uh, afterwards. So cyber.gov.au. So then we've got a spear phishing. And I won't spend too much time on this, but it is important to understand that spear phishing is a thing, um, which is the dang more dangerous side of phishing. It's a targeted attempt to steal sensitive information from a specific victim. So a lot of the factors we spoke about before are still going to be those warning signs, except this is targeted. It is going to be addressed to you. They might uh, use names of other people in your organisation. Um, they might know some of your processes. They've actually done some research on you or your business and crafted, spent a bit more time on this, which is why it is more dangerous. A lot of this information is taken from websites, social media, LinkedIn. So just be aware of your digital footprint. What is out there? A lot of businesses, you do want this sort of information out there. You want people to know who you are. Um, and it's not about reducing that, but being aware of what is out there so that if you've got on there that you've that you're the business owner and that you've got um, admin staff and these sort of things and they start to see these names and they'll start to use them in these sort of attempts. So it's just about being aware of that. So that's just an example there, um, that's Source Community Bank. So fishing as we spoke about, casting the rod in, just taking some bites, spear fishing is a lot more targeted and therefore a lot more dangerous. We talk about passwords. One of the best protection against these threats are passwords. Creating strong passwords is important. And I know this is hard when you're balancing work life, your own business, personal life. The amount of passwords we've got now, I reckon are probably in excess of 100 that we've got accounts to. And you think that's a ridiculous number when you start thinking that, oh, you've signed up online for utility bills, your rego, ATO, couple of different email addresses, plus all your work stuff. It, it does actually start to add up quite quickly and you realize how many different um, accounts you have. Just some generic advice, avoid using birth dates, anniversaries, pet, child, spouse details. These can be sourced off social media. So if you've just got your kid's name as your password and you've got photos of your kids and talk about your kids on social media, that's gonna be one of the first things they try to gain access. Have different passwords and usernames for different accounts. Now this is the advice um, and it is quite difficult, as we said, when you've got that many accounts that you need to be on top of. Um, you can look at things like password managers, um, which can assist you in this process. And I'll explain why this is important in a couple of slides time. Don't write your passwords down where they're easily located or accessed. So if you've got a point of sale device and you've got the password on it and customers might be able to see it or members of the public can see it, then obviously that's, that could cause an issue um, and that could get leaked and someone could pick up on that and that just increases your vulnerability. Where possible, don't email for, uh, passwords or provide them over the phone. The phone's probably not too much to, to worry about. With emails, what a lot of people don't understand is email is actually a really insecure form of communication. Uh, it's just socially acceptable that we do a lot of our correspondence via email. Unless you use a service that is especially encrypted email, um, and you would know if you are using that, then emails can be intercepted. If you've got passwords on there, they can get access to passwords as well. So just be mindful of that. Change passwords regularly. So not only have different passwords for different accounts, but also change them regularly. I know you're probably throwing stuff at the screen right now. This is the advice. This is best practice. Um, and I'll go into, this sort of relates to the having different accounts, different passwords, different accounts, and changing them regularly. And I'll explain why and it'll become a bit more apparent shortly. And I think we've got another one. Right, passwords with random numbers, letters, most secure. So the more complex, the harder they are to break. <clears throat> By way of example, we've got three different passwords here. We ran this on our social media um, probably a couple of months ago, I think. 
And it was quite an interesting discussion about which of these three passwords were the most secure. So you've got the first one, which is password with a 070. It's quite fancy. Uh, second one, July. O's instead of zeros for 2020. And then pen, horse, green. So have a bit of a look at that. Have a bit of a think yourself and think what one you would think would be the most secure out of those three. And we'll go through typically how long it would take for a piece of software to crack each of these passwords. So for the top one, looking about an hour. I'd be surprised if it took that long with something quite that simple. The second one, again, only an hour, even though we substituted uh, numerals or some characters in there. And pen horse green, which looks quite simple, would actually take a year. Now that comes down to complexity. It's not a single word that you find in a dictionary. A lot of this software will just run what they call a dictionary through, so any word um, and names, and they'll use that to try and crack passwords. Because it's got three, it makes it a lot longer. And this could be uh, anything that's important to you that might not be related. So passphrases could be, pen could be something on your desk. Horse could be your favorite animal, green your favorite color. Each of these individually are really poor passwords. Put them together in a phrase, that makes it really hard to guess. Of course, we go one step further and combine those three, a pen horse green, some capitals, special character numbers, and we've had 200 million years to, to crack. So that, that's how we look at complex passwords. Um, and that'll give you a bit of an idea of how to, how to create those complex passwords, even though you have to create so many of them. We'll talk now about credential stuffing. So credential stuffing is the automated injection of breached username password pairs in order to fraudulently gain access to user accounts. You could probably read that three times and still not have any idea what that means. All that means is that your credentials have been stolen somehow. It's been a breach. It could be something you signed up to 10 years ago with an account that you logged into twice. But that account, you used your email address and the same password you always use for everything. What the crooks do is when they get hold of those details and they are for sale on the dark web, get hold of that, they'll try it. That same combination for your social media accounts, for your business login. So that's why you need to change those passwords. And that's why you need to have unique passwords. If it's only for that account, if you've got a unique password for every account, then if that gets breached, that's only that account that's gonna be affected. It's not gonna flow on to your bank details, to your social media profiles, work, and all those sort of things. There is a site you can go to, which is Australian, called Have I Been Pwned, which is Have I Been Owned with the P70. Um, and you can put in your email address there and see whether that email address has been breached before, and I have some information about what's involved in that breach, whether it's email address and password, and or IP address, and location, all this sort of information. When you do it, and unless you've got a reasonably new password, it'll flag, flash up red and don't have a heart attack. Mine has been breached several times. Um, I think I've, I've got four or five different breaches on there, but I'm not concerned because the passwords for those sites, I don't use anywhere else, okay? And that's that reason we speak about having those different passwords. If it's unmanageable to have different passwords for everything you log on to, just make sure banking is different to social media, which is different to stuff you have at work. Okay, just have a bit of that separation. Two-factor authentication. So it provides a way of double checking that you're really the person you claim to be when you log on to, it says online accounts, but it could be a computer, when you log on to anything. Um, if you haven't heard of it before, you probably do know what it is without actually knowing what it is. So, Two-factor authentication, which is 2FA, or multi-factor authentication, which is MFA, which just means it's more than two, so you could have three different ways. It's just a way to double check um, that you are who you say you are. So quite often you would have experienced, particularly with banking, you're trying to do a certain transaction, you need to log into your account with your username and password, and then I might send a code to your phone. So that could be SMS, could be an app you've got on your phone, could be as simple as sending a code to your email that you then need to put in. All those things, uh, two-factor authentication. So that could be something you know, which is normally your password, something you have, so it could be uh, a USB key that you've got, could be your phone that's got access to SMS um, or to a, an application, or something you are. So fingerprint, you think, you know, we're not really in that 
biosphere, but quite often we've got fingerprint detection on our phones. It's no different having a pin code and a fingerprint at the same time on your, on your mobile phone. And this is really important. And if we think back to the previous slide when we talk about credential stuffing, if we think, okay, password may have been breached, this could be out there, but even if they do try and access my accounts, they're not going to get access because I've got my phone and that's got the app with the generating the code that I need to access this. So it slows things down. And from a business point of view, you've got to look at when you're going to enable it, when you're not going to enable it. But it does provide you significantly more protection. So if you've got anything with payroll or sensitive information that you really want to protect, see if you can get 2FA on there. And a lot of services do have it. All different email accounts, all different online accounts now, social media will have access to 2FA options. So prevention measures. We've got this checklist uh, attached to the webinar. Now, this was designed last year specifically for this exact format. And as I touched on at the start of the presentation, these are extremely low cost, if not free, preventative solutions to protect your business from cybercrime. These are not going to provide state-of-the-art protection, but it's going to bring up that baseline and prevent a lot of attacks that you may be susceptible to. Um, and we've spoken about some of these, but we'll go through a few more in depth now. We'll start with administrator access. If you're not familiar with what that is, that's basically the highest level of access you might have. So if you've got um, account keeping software, you might have administrator access that can modify, add, delete, whatever. And you might have a user access, which is just a read only. Or if you think of it from a point of sale device, the manager might have access to be able to print off reports and those sort of things. And the console operators might have user access where they can actually do the transactions. This can be on anything. This could be on your, your routers, so your Wi-Fi devices, your internet devices, could be on computers, software, anything. Um, and it applies to pretty much everything you've got it on is look at who's got administrator access and why and regularly assess that. The less accounts with administrator access, the less likely you are to be breached. If you've got an old employee that had administrator access to an account and it's sitting dormant, you're not going to notice if there's activity on that account when they're working in the background, uh, infiltrating the network and then deploying malware. Next thing you know, you're subject to a ransomware attack. So it's going through all the different platforms you've got and really restricting that. Who actually has it and who actually needs it to perform their function and regularly reassess. We've got across the backups. Well, especially when we talk about ransomware, backups are the best protection. And they should be stored offline. The reason for that, if they're attached to your network and your network gets compromised, there's a chance that so will your backups. The benefit of the backups and storing them offline is that whenever you last backed up to when you've been attacked is the amount of data you lose. So if you're backing up every 24 hours and for whatever reason you do fall victim to a ransomware attack, you can just restore from that backup you're back up and running, you've lost 24 hours worth of work. Okay, so that's what you've got to consider about how regularly you need to back up, and that depends on your type of work and the type of information. Um, but the benefit is that, you know, if you are subject to a cyber attack or if your computer just crashes, you've got access to that stuff. You're not starting from scratch again, you haven't lost all that information. Passwords we've already spoken about, multi factor authentication we've already spoken about, which is the same as 2FA. Antivirus, make sure the antivirus is up to date and conduct regular scans. Okay, that is your protection. It needs to be up to date because threats are constantly changing and antivirus is constantly updating to negate those threats. So if you haven't updated it for 12 months, then that's going to leave you vulnerable. Which brings us across the software patching, which sounds like a complicated term, but really that's just those annoying updates you get that says you're not using the latest version click here to install and update the next one and you keep putting it off because it's not the best time to do it. You really need to update them as soon as possible. Again, a lot of these software patches, so it could be from uh, Microsoft Word, it could be your accounting software you're using, it could be your point of sale software. They might identify a threat, a way in, a back door for these people. If you patch it, it's going to prevent that. Okay, so that's why you need to get on top of it as soon as you can. Dual factor release doesn't apply so much in this situation. Um, it applies more about business email compromise, which is not necessarily covered in this topic. But what that relates to is just having a, a process. If you're going to transfer large volumes of money, to have a, a second person also look at that. 
you're talking about spear phishing, that could be an example where they do some research, they find out your customers, they know who you are, they send an email with an email address that looks like someone that works for you and says, I need this transferred as a matter of urgency, it's been an issue, the customer's unhappy, can you please transfer this money? So that dual fact release is just having that second person to authenticate that. It could be as simple as ringing the customer to say, okay, have you changed your bank details? Why well, would this email saying that you change your bank details? Just taking that second step before you release any large sums of money. Phishing, we've covered a fair bit tonight, um, but as I touched on, that will help you, but you also need to have your staff trained in what phishing looks like. And even if it's just sitting down through that quiz, which will take you five minutes, just might be enough to protect you and the rest of your employees against a phishing attack. The HR review, we spoke a little bit about when we're talking about administrator access. That's just those unused credentials. If you've got logins and you've been running some software or you've gone to sale for, for 10 years and you've got old employees that have got old accounts on there, you need to deactivate them. The accounts that are not being used are the ones that are most at risk. So develop part of that HR policy that when someone uh, resigns and they leave the workforce, they're returning their uniform, you're finalising um, accounts, pay for them, also having that checklist or whatever format you're using, that you're going to deactivate any accounts that they've had access to. Now, if you've had a disgruntled employee leave and they know common passwords, part of that could be updating passwords that you've been used as well. So reporting, reporting is important, um, particularly from my point of view, when we see the reports, we know what's happening, we can tailor the prevention advice to that. Um, ransomware attacks are common, which is why we're doing this topic on it today. So it is important and the, there's a correlation between reports being made in the background, a lot of intelligence goes into it. We can link bank accounts, Bitcoin accounts, all these sort of things in the background, email addresses that are linked between offending across Australia and then target those sort of investigations. Uh, so you can report at cyber.gov.au forward slash report, which is called Report Cyber, it's a new online platform, our local police station, and we've got the one to run to before number there if you do need some advice, but that's just a call centre. So your first point of call would be um, Report Cyber or local police station. We've got some resources. One of the web pages that we manage and own is the one at the top there, the police.sa.gov.au forward slash scams. That's one that we update regularly with scams that are affecting South Australians. So that page is unique in the sense that we're looking at what's happening in our own backyard. Um, we've got case studies of reports that are coming in that have been sanitised, just so that people understand what method scammers are using, because they're not going away. Um, their scripts will change, but the methods will largely stay the same. We've got scamwatch.gov.au. So if you come across a scam, you don't fall victim to it, you can report there. Um, we've also got information and preventive advice on scams. That cyber.gov.au, which is the ACSC site which I spoke about before, uh, a lot of information on there. And I will draw your attention to the nomoreransom.org. So that's an international um, website who basically store decryption tools. So basically a set of keys to how to unlock ransomware. So it could be a way that you can decrypt the ransomware without having to completely write off those assets. Depends on the type of ransomware used. If it's an old one, they're likely going to have a key. If it's something new and improved, then they're not likely to have that. One thing I will discuss before we go that wasn't in the presentation is the, and it could be a question if you're thinking yourself is, do I pay that ransom? My advice is going to be no. Okay, you're going to have to look at that critically from a business point of view, but I will give you some considerations to have in relation to that. One, they are running a business. Okay, this is a business for them. They've got business structures. If you pay that ransom, you are supporting that business. And then it could be the person from the shop down from you that is the next target. It could be the tradies working over the road that get shut down next. So you've got to really sort of think of it from that point of view as well as your own um, self-preservation. The other issue, one of the other issues is you're dealing with criminals here. They're not bound by a contract, Small Business Commission aren't going to help you negotiate terms with them when you pay the ransom and they don't unlock the software and you're still stuck with a ransomware attack locked computer. 
The third thing, other consideration is they may unlock it for you, but they may leave the malware, so the ransomware in there, and then a month later, you're shut out again and they're asking for more money because they know that you can pay it. So there's some of the considerations you've got to have when it comes to ransomware. The best protection are those backups that we spoke about, and that also protects you against critical failure for your computer or your, your systems anyway. So that's the end of the presentation. So if you've got any questions that have come through, we'll try and address them now, otherwise I'll look at them later. Okay, we'll socially distance. Yep, it's fine. Thank, Thank you very much for that informative uh, session. Uh, let's see if you can come back to the screen. I'll read the, I'll be the disembodied voice from the distance. Which antivirus software should people use? Right, very good question. And because I work for the police, I can't give you any recommendations on that. Uh, I just say do you do your research when it comes to antivirus. Um, if you've got Windows, it comes with Windows Defender, which is actually quite good. Um, you just got to sort of make that decision about what you're willing to put on there. I wouldn't be looking at anything that is free that doesn't already come with it. So Windows Defender comes with Windows. That's a bit different, but if you're going and you're downloading a free version of something off the internet, I'd be aware of that. So that's more likely to have malware on it than it is to protect you. But if it's a reputable brand, um, then you should be should be pretty safe. Thank you. Uh, and if you do have questions, please uh, log them online. Uh, Maria's here writing down very uh, curiously at the moment. Second question: How do we deal with phishing using text messaging? So how do we deal with it? Well, the, the best thing is to just not, not answer it, not reply to it. The problem with messaging and the same thing with, with phones, when it comes up and you've got that cooler ID, you think you know where the origin of that is actually coming from. There's software out there that lets you, you change those numbers. So it'll change the cooler ID so that it might look like it's coming from the police station, or they'll change it on the SMS so it looks like it's coming from, from my gut. So there's not really a lot you can do about it because you won't know the true source of it. The best thing is to, to delete that. On that phishing quiz, there are some examples there and I do have two SMS ones to have a look at. Um, my main advice is that if you're in doubt and you get contact and it's from your bank or it's from the utility company, disregard the email, disregard the SMS and call the bank on a number you know to be true. Make that contact and then you know who you're speaking to. They'll quickly tell you if there's a problem or not. Thank you. Uh, this question, if a SSD slash HDD is connected to your PC, will the ransomware affect that as well, or just the hard drive on the PC? Okay, quite a, quite a technical question. It probably depends on, on the setup. So ransomware can affect an entire network. So it could be anything that's on your local network. Um, so it would probably depend on whether it's on, whether it's encrypted. Um, the best thing to do would be have that encrypted with something like BitLocker if it is Windows, because that comes with it. Um, so that then you actually have to unlock that to gain access to it. But the danger is if that is connected to the physical computer that is susceptible or gets infected by ransomware, that it certainly could spread to that, that hard drive. Okay. The next question, how does ransomware affect files stored on the cloud? Very good question. So again, it depends on, on how the ransomware um, gets to the system and how much access they can actually get once they're in there. So there is a potential that they, they could get access to cloud storage. However, if it is on the cloud and it's not directly connected, then the, that may actually offer some, some protection. So it really depends on how your network is set up and how far they can get into that, that system. If you're just opening up ransomware and it affects your laptop and doesn't go anywhere further than that, then in that situation, the stuff on the cloud would be secure. Um, however, if you're talking a larger network, um, you've got multiple things connected and they get across the whole network and a lot of devices are connected to the cloud, then there is a possibility that that, that could be affected as well. Uh, now, another question, where is the phishing quiz? The phishing quiz. So, if you go to www.cyber.gov.au and then there'll be a search bar there for phishing quiz, so phishing PH, you should be able to find it. So it's on the Australian Cyber Security Centre website. Um, I'll, I'll provide a link afterwards if you have trouble finding that. Uh, the last question was, where is the phishing quiz? Sorry, there's uh, 
we've just been notified that some people have difficulty hearing my question. Uh, next question is clarifying an external SSD HDD. I think that might be more what are they? Well, so if that's going to come from someone else, that, that's basically a hard drive, so storage device. So if it's external, it just means it's not physically in your computer. So the, the portable hard drives, like a big USB, basically. So um, you can use that as, as your backup. If you're using that for the backup, you have it plugged in, you back up, you pull it out. Once that's not connected, then that is secure. So SSDs um, and the HDDs, they're just, just hard drives. So SSDs, solid state disk, I think. Um, just two different different versions of hard drives. That's it. Well, good. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sergeant Newman. And what we'll do, we'll give you a round of applause. Um, normally, we would have uh, uh, an audience in the room, but we don't. So uh, I'm presuming you're all safe clapping because it's a very, very good presentation and a real insight into something that should concern every business. That concludes our event today. Thank you for logging in and watching online.